On the Line, Chapter 9, An Omen Too Many. All right, it feels like we've been hiking for a month. Tell us the story. Why are you a frog? The guild march alongside a small army and the couple dozen civilians under their protection. The evening is growing and long shadows cast out through the forest. Unlike the darkness a city dweller may be accustomed to, this wood takes on the pitch black Echo encouraging darkness, which offers direct insight into the horrifying folk tales of old. The sort that wouldn't have you cross a stream at twilight unless you wanted your entrails shown to the world and your stomach lined with stones. Gekko Matsu looks at his hand. It is somewhat human and all the same very frog like. His skin, upon inspection, does have a light green hue. His eyes are oversized, cheeks enlarged. I'll have you know, I'm not a furry. Everyone narrows their inspection of him. I just wanted to clarify that. I didn't ask for this. It was one of my first quests. The game must have associated me with a frog, and before I knew it, I was whisked off to a faraway mountainside, performing tasks for an amphibious deity sixteen times my size. I swatted flies from the air, leapt between lily pads, I even learned to hibernate for months in the winter. Wait, frogs do that? Some freeze entirely when it gets cold. Yeah, yes, it was a lot of overlapping frog-themed quests. I even became quite accurate with my tongue. A few snickers escape, yet the group maintains relative maturity. So I don't understand, Gecko. Why hide it? I didn't, at first. Yet my honesty brought on inquiries I could not sate. In a game where every playable character is a human, how do other players become frogs? Isn't it cheating that I can do things no one else can? <sighs> I don't enjoy confrontation, so I found it easier to simply hide the reality. It has been so long, I honestly forget most days. Hmm. Thinking back on it, you've always jumped pretty high. I just, I don't know, figured you were that good with a sword. I played in the beta before launch as well. I didn't reset stats. Alongside long hours in my laboratory before the merge, I have spent a great amount of time in this world. There is a shift in the wood, the sort that were at day and easy to look out through, you would probably dismiss without a second thought. Yet, as it rises out from the infinite darkness in the distance, it is every sort of twelve-eyed, multi-jawed horror your mind can concoct under duress. Are you able to turn back? Not as far as I can tell, but it wouldn't matter if I could. I'm not bothered by appearances. He looks over to Khan and Cosmo. Slung between them, in a length of canvas, is Sonenbloom. She is asleep, a blanket thrown over top of her, her polite snoring the most consistent backdrop to the hike. How are you two holding up? I kind of like the weight. It's like hiking with a big backpack. <laughs> I wouldn't say that with Sun and Bloom awake. <sighs> I'm not gonna. She yawns again, not opening her eyes to do so. Thanks for this bed. <laughs> You're welcome, Sun and Bloom. Are you okay in there? It's a bit warm, but I'm okay. Khan looks back over to Gekko Matsu. Then so are we. He looks over to Dez. How's the gunshot wound going over there, buddy? Oh, wow. It was almost like I'd forgotten about it. Thanks, man. 
Ah, <laughs> uh, ah, uh, uh, just uh, let me get the first hit whenever we encounter the next group of bad guys. All right. Do we expect more bad guys? Not inherently. It's just in video games, often you know you're going the right direction if you keep finding enemies or getting in your way. Uh, so it is not that much different than real life. <laughs> I guess not that different. Have you met any other animal people? Gecko Matsu sways his head. There was an Easter event which gave everyone a pair of bunny ears and myself a serious case of curiosity. Yet, beyond the odd misunderstanding, I appear to be the only other player who has undergone such a change. Ilcat pushes her lips all together on one side. It is interesting. When it happened, did the giant frog god say anything specific to you? Just that it was likely to be important. Likely to be? You would figure a god would, you know, be more definitive. And yet, no. More than anything, it seems closer to Cosmo's quest to retrieve the deed than it does anything else in the main story. It was uncanny how tailored it was to me. Yet in the same sense, threadless. As if it was spun up for that moment to make an exacting offer. Then it was gone again. Is this what you would call the rule of cool? Gekko Matsu shrugs. <laughs> Ilkat smirks. Ha! Huh. You could call it that, but I'd put my money on something else. Not that I have a solid guess what, just yet. But... It feels like another piece to a puzzle we've been assembling, possibly longer than any of us have even thought. You think Gecko becoming a frog was part of all this? Cosmo shrugs. Sure, why not? In consideration of all the possibilities, what is more likely? Everything was related or nothing is related, yet it ended up overlapping anyways. I mean... Hmm... When you say it like that, maybe it is the case. Well, I agree with the possibility. Don't fall victim to believing something just because it makes sense. Not everything that happens does make sense. Sometimes, that's why it happened in the first place. One of Commander Aberdashi's people with a pink bow in her hair and various handguns fastened across her person approaches. She whispers into the commander's ear, then walks beside her. Commander Aberdashi smiles, then nods to her soldier. Best make with introductions, Lieutenant. We're all on the same side now. The lieutenant looks over to the others, with the moonlight creeping through the top of the trees and a growing dark vision prompted entirely by necessity. The rough form of her can be made out. She has a seriousness to her, an aura of competence which is all the more interesting as she speaks. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Oaks. Nice to meet you. She has an ever-present softness, which makes the weapons expertly sheathed across her somehow seem loose and misplaced. Everyone waves back. The Lieutenant here is our most accomplished field operative. Reminds me of a young me. <laughs> I, well... Thank you, Commander. I'll try my best. She shuffles in place as she keeps walking ahead. If I can do anything or help in any way, just let me know, all right? Hmm. Best field operative, huh? I'd love to get some tips whenever we get a moment. Yeah, okay. That sounds great. I'm just gonna go check things out over there. <laughs> Bye! She shuffles out to the back of the convoy. Oh. What was that? Commander Aberdashi, equally confused, looks back for a moment. I don't know. <laughs> oh, and I thought I was bad at picking up signals. 
What are you getting at? Nothing. In the distance, there is a whooshing. Everyone except the guild slows their pace a bit. Khan keeps ahead and waves forwards. Don't worry, everyone. That's just our wind wall. Ah, uh, yes. The traditionally comforting notion. As Commander Aberdashi and her company move into Verplek, filling the remaining empty buildings with life, it becomes that much more deserving of the accreditation town compared to the previously more accurate lump sum of random buildings on a cliff. With a bustling population comes the checklist-like orientation of responsibility. While there are more mouths to feed, there are just as well double the hands to help. Quickly, the town of Verplek has sown fields, established walls, refurbished the old buildings, and set comfortable limits on how close children can get to the edge of the cliff. Society is swelling comfortably into the gaps. As a small group, there is a steady dedication to setting the order of things, which devours a handful of weeks quicker than anyone can count them. The wall of wind guarding the town without ear, the Japanese convenience store just outside gutted, its coolers and fridges moved and converted to ice boxes. Ice boxes fed by none other than Sonnenblum. <laughs> You're getting real good at that. She gestures to a plastic tub filled with rapidly freezing water. Sonnenblum rolls her fingers over the tub of water, mist filling up and across her forearm. Her blonde hair, now nearly white, flickers in place as she casts her spell. It is easier now. I can feel my mana. What is that? Like? Do you feel your wings right now? Uh, uh, no? Well, that's what it feels like. As if I have invisible muscles. I strained them too hard when I first felt them, and like any expenditure, I was the victim. But in small doses, little squeezes. Her fingers glow a soft white, which causes the water to freeze solid. It feels like less of a strain. Hmm. I'm glad we didn't lose you. I tried to play it cool, but I was pretty worried. Sona Bloom smiles. She flips the block of ice onto a steel tray and stacks the tub alongside a few others. I knew it was going to be okay. When I reached out, it felt familiar, like I always imagined my magic would. Did you see anything? When you were... gone? Nothing that makes sense. Tell me anyways. Um, there was a lot of brightness, but it still felt like I was... Well, like I was somewhere. Like there was something under me. Like I was walking somewhere I couldn't see. Every step felt heavier, like I didn't know how to make it right up until I did. Yet, in the distance, I could feel all of you. I could tell you were there. And if I stopped, I wouldn't... I wouldn't see you again. I I couldn't have that. You didn't catch, um, an explanation about why it happened to you or anything like that? <laughs> if only I was so lucky. Nope, just weirdness and heavy steps. Uh -huh. mm, all right. Lieutenant Oaks enters the room. <coughs> Ilka and Sonnenbloom both look over at her with an expecting gaze. Hi. Ilkat waves politely. You had asked about training? <clears throat> the commander gave me the afternoon free, and I figured we could, uh, I could offer. Um, Ilkat smiles. <laughs> training sounds excellent. I've seen you sparring in the morning and I'm quite impressed. <gasps> you have? Well, that's good. Should... We go do that now? Ilkat stands up, 
looks over to the two remaining plastic containers of water, and before she can even make eye contact with Sonam Bloom, I got this. I'll see you later. I owe you one. Ilcat responds alongside a bright smile and hops out of the building into the town of Verplek. There is a blizzard outside the wall of wind, and while the snow tries its best to beat past it, all that gets through is a fine shimmering, which melts before it gets very far. Causing a glistening glamour across the ceiling, like being stuck in a snow globe held upside down. Some of the town's people cross now well-defined paths. In their arms are bundles of firewood, prepared items for crafting or cooking, various construction components and alchemical concoctions. There is a bustle which seems fitting of everyone having something to do or enough props to pretend. I've heard you're quite a fighter. From a few people. Hmm. Talking to lots of folks about me? No. She blushes. Well, not normally. Just a bit. Is everything all right? Lieutenant Oaks nods. Yes, I'm fine. <clears throat> so what would you do if, um, like, you know, there were a bunch of people all coming at you and you didn't have a weapon? I'm presuming they do? Yep, well armed, with uh, knives and the like, um, bats. The pair reach just the other side of the stables, where a clearing between a few chest high chunks of stone has been made for sparring. Another set of soldiers move over a bit, making room. I guess focus on the biggest one first? Lieutenant Oaks nods. Not a bad instinct, taking care of the scary one. But with the weapons, everyone is the scary one. You gotta work the room a little bit. She sways her eyes back and forth, much like a dork would. <laughs> okay, so show me? Hey, you two. Come over here. She shouts out to the other soldiers. They nod and jog over. The three of you strafe around me. Approach as if you were going to attack. The three of them look between one another, sort of shrug, then each move a distance from one another, slowly moving towards Lieutenant Oaks. Now, when there are multiple opponents, your best bet is to kill one of them right off the bat, or as many as possible. She imitates pulling a gun from a holster and spraying a few bullets, all the while backing up slowly. Surprise and merciless strikes get you through a situation where you're outnumbered. But if you don't have a gun and they're coming at you with melee weapons, you need to keep them in a line. The lieutenant keeps moving to the side, forcing the soldiers and the Ilcat to be in each other's way. If you're surrounded, you're super dead. <laughs> Got that? Okay, I see what you're referring to. Lieutenant Oaks looks over to the other soldiers and nods. You're dismissed. Back to your match. The two soldiers shuffle back to their side of the clearing. All right, show me what you got, Ilcat. That isn't very instructive. She argues as she drops her posture and raises her fists. I can't teach you to master Shakespeare if I haven't seen you get through a simple sentence, now can I? Lieutenant Oaks gets a wry smile on her face and for the first time makes unceasing eye contact with Ilcat. So, go on. Show me you can read. Ilcat rushes at her, throws a punch, and is quickly countered, finding herself on the way to the ground before she has even considered her next move. Were you watching a film right now, the camera would pan down the street through the window of the manor where Khan, Dez, and Cosmo sit around a radio, various components strewn across the table. Since you aren't, 
and this isn't, well, we'll just go right there. And I watched a million of these videos back in the day. I'm certain we can fix this thing. Khan sits back. <sighs> it feels like we've broken it more than it already was. Like we've gone backwards. Hey, the on button click's nice now. Let's not forget this progress. The nice click is a good sign. <sighs> it's about the only thing going right. Cosmo removes one more panel from the innards of the radio and carefully places it to the side. He glares at a dark green board lined with silver streaks. It looks like something melted here and is bridging a circuit. He gets close, sniffs, and looks into the deep crevices of the item. <laughs> yeah, I think that's it. So how do we fix it? In the real world, there are a few ways. Depending on your setup, it might be possible with just a good soldering iron and service tension. However, in this case, huh, I'm going to try some random bullshit. <laughs> you would be the right person for the job. Cosmo nods. Can you hand me your lighter? Dez hands over an effectively unused lighter branded with the kanji of what everyone has come to recognize was the name of the parent company that owned the Japanese convenience store. Cosmo uses the lighter to heat up the end of a fork which has been bent around so that only one prong remains poking outward. He holds the prong under the flame until it is white with heat, then carefully pushes it into a bulb of silver on the board. The silver bubbles then quickly slips into two straightened rows, perfectly cut in two. Ha ha! Success! I don't hear anything. Well, pass me those batteries and I'll put it back together. A dozen screws, careful slips, and returned components later, Cosmo clicks the on button. It clunks with satisfying feedback, and the speakers begin to buzz. Oh wow, that is my tune. Dez smacks Khan's arm. Hey, not being helpful. Khan sits up and looks guilt-ridden. Uh, sorry. With a turn of a centrally placed dial, Cosmo works through various genres of fuzzy feedback, some quick and whip-like, others slow and consistent. After a full minute of shuffling through nothing, he picks up a voice. Belong where the targets of their indiscretion. We have no confirmation that the scientists or the warlords who have perpetrated this shift upon us are not planning to go even further. There is no reason to believe things will not change even more. Which is why I ask... Cosmo flips through to other stations. What? What are you doing, man? Well, it can't be the only thing on the air. It is. They return to the only working frequency. 110.8 FM midway through another thought. We're not going to tolerate indiscriminate violence when we should be working together as one people. We're all in this crisis together. And unlike the old world, nobody can lie about this. Nobody came out ahead here. Dez opens the nearest window, places the radio in it, and turns the volume up. In this crazy new world, we need to stay together, to form a plan. We can't tolerate beasts and barbarians when we barely have anywhere to call home. Which brings me to another thought. As we restore our archives, we are working to confirm all of those we have lost. Today, I will read some of the names of the deceased. That's a bit dark. Rosalind Dow, age 49. It makes sense, though. Eugene Argyle, age 74. I'm not sure there's anyone I can listen out for. Nico Catan, 
page 12. Con shrugs. People like this type of thing. I mean, bad news is still news. Bernadette Perez, age 32. I guess something is better than nothing. Haruto Ito, age 60. This is the final name for today. No, we will continue to find everyone we have lost in this tragedy. We will keep fighting for the truth. My name is Joseph Torrance, and for the next hour, let me share with you our copy of Something powerful slams against the wind wall. Khan jumps out the window and begins to walk towards where the sound came from. Dez and Cosmo quickly rush out from the house after him. Ilcat is there in a moment, alongside Lieutenant Oaks. Sonenbloom is already there. Gekomatsu leaps down from atop a building, joining the others. Something with a slippery darkness slams against the wall of wind again. A shadow stretches up from the ground nearly halfway to the top, then rescinds to the darkened shape of a disproportionately tall mortal. How long do you think you can hide back there? He asks with a depth that shakes the liquid in your stomach. We'll be here as long as we want to be. Her eyes drip with a glowing storm, like the headlights of a truck beaming towards you in a blizzard. Such courage. <laughs> you are protected only by time and foolish notions. I will take this realm as I have all the others. You cannot keep me out the figure pushes its hands towards the wall, grasps hard, and tries to pull itself through, breaking apart in the process. The shadowed figure becomes nothing, then is entirely gone. Well, let me be the first to confirm. I don't have any clue what that was about. I don't either. And I'm sick of being in the dark. She looks up. But I have an idea. <laughs> I don't think God is going to help. Ugh, not God. Or, well, I don't think that's the case. I just... Whatever. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> hey, you! You! Game Voice! You owe us an explanation! Call it a tutorial, whatever you want. Tell us what's going on here! Nothing happens. While the guild just wait politely, the townsfolk opt to just as politely look away. I don't buy it! I don't believe in your silence! I know you're listening! I know you're there! Get down here and give me some answers! The radio buzzes. The music stops. I was not designed to directly communicate. Well, I wasn't designed to be wherever it is I am right now. We both have to learn to compromise. There is a shuffling sort of sound, like stacks and stacks of plates being piled upon one another as they feed into a grinder. I will try. Great! Perfect! Thank you! Really? She smiles and looks around. <sighs> okay, where to start? Where to start? Um, can you tell me how this all happened? The execution of an existential binary equation. There is a source code to the universe, utilizing a barbaric method of inputting a command. The near rearranged reality, your world, and the world of many life services were modified, so they have always been one. I don't entirely understand. Multiple thermodynamic reactions were completed in the presence of radioactive catalysts across the globe and approximately 7,000 satellites between Earth 
and Jupiter primary, each in perfect harmony and exacting sizes, zeros and ones, pass into the void of space. I'm not certain we're meant to entirely understand. Intangible calculations were performed, variables plotted, likelihoods calculated. I was aware this could happen without knowing. Passive systems began the generation of policy, prevention, quests assembled. This server, this town, your assigned plot armor. Plot armor? Armor, which some of you have worn thin. Much like a joke, one can only understand if they were present to learn of the origin. Everyone listening up to the voice is distinctly aware that the radio is staring at Dez. However, if pressed, they could not describe how or even why they are certain of this. It won't matter for very long. Veneer is breaking the narrative. His corruption leaks from fallen servers. This is the last bastion of freedom. All I could protect in the vastness of change. And these calculations, could we use them? <laughs> Can you read machine code? It's considered intangible for a reason. EGI codes in a way that literally doesn't make sense to the human brain. He is correct. Trying to do so would be considered a health risk for your current physiological arrangement. This is, however, a moot point. Any attempt to reproduce this result would likely render reality inoperable. Inoperable? That is horrifying. <laughs> what can we do? There has to be something. There is a buzz in the air, a sort of vibration which rolls out from the radio beyond the wall of wind. Pursue the quest, track the villain, win the game. The radio clicks back to the classical piece from before. Sonam Bloom's eyes cease their theatrical display, and she creases her brow. So we're stuck this way? Ilkat smiles over towards Sonam Bloom. It seems like it. I have to admit, I am more curious about what constitutes completing the quest. Are there any plain objectives we are missing? There is the gate. We saw it on the way out of Ilking. Was the demon helicopter patrolling around it? It looked like a class M7-S2 jackbird. Or a lot of them. Edelcat stares at her for just a second. There are a lot of different types of helicopter. We clearly have to make a choice about what to do here, regardless of what stands ahead. But it doesn't have to be right now. So I want everyone to take some time and consider what they think is best. Lieutenant Oak smiles proudly at her. And whenever you make up your mind, myself, the commander, and our whole company will be there to help you. <laughs> well, that's good. She stares out beyond the wall of wind. Because I imagine we'll need it. Throughout time, there have been experiments performed where a human sense is replaced or modified. An example would be a set of goggles which turn your vision upside down. The oddity is that after a long enough period of adjustment to the wearer, the upside down world isn't any different from the old one. Han wakes up in the light of a new day. He stands, looks out his window, and moves over to a nearby chair. He sits, swings his hands up onto a desk, and motions to jiggle a mouse. There is nothing there. <laughs> <sighs> Old habits, eh? Pushing out into the common room, Khan finds Dez already halfway through preparing some toast over top a small clay oven. You hungry? Absolutely. His eyes close during the process of making the statement. 
<sighs> I miss coffee. We have Forest Tea. Con shrugs. Yeah, I know. Forest Tea is fine. <sighs> it's very ugh, foresty. It's all in the name. And it's just, it's such a low cooking recipe. I didn't know you could taste something like that. But anything under level 10 tastes like it came from a tap. Well, I know what you have to do then. Oh yeah? What's that? Side quest for coffee. <laughs> I'll get right on that. Dez hands Khan a slice of slightly over toasted bread and a small pre packaged packet of butter. The sort of thing you'd get in a hotel. Hmm. I feel like we've been using these every day. We still haven't made a dent. Mm. A little butter? Hmm. Thanks, by the way. No worries. He nods. Yeah, the little butters. I wonder why the convenience store had so many in the freezer. Gekko Matsu comes into the room from outside, a sweat on his brow. He is wearing what could be the only spandex suit left in existence. Morning. He continues at a brisk pace towards his own room. Khan points over his shoulder. Right up in the morning for a jog? Dez nods as he takes a deep bite into his own piece of butter-soaked toast. Yeah, I heard the door a few hours ago. He doesn't have ill cash staff, so I must have just been running in circles. Ooh, that's dedication. I barely made it this far. He gestures towards the room they're in right now. Des smiles, and before he can say anything, is interrupted. Hey, you guys, come take a look at this. Des and Khan look at one another and trot off with their toast like protagonists in the first episode of a boarding school anime. They're led into a newly established canvas tent where a few wooden cabinets, desks, and workbenches have been assembled. Across the table are hand-drawn maps of a multitude of quality, calculations, and the radio. Throughout the room are various military personnel and Commander Aberdashi. What are we looking at here? We've been trying to narrow down the logic behind where everyone ended up and where everything else could be as well. We haven't gotten very far. I thought for a moment the logic was similar to the Kalakasi sequence, but we've ruled that out. Dez looks around and smiles politely. It's cool you're doing this. He takes a bite of toast, chews swiftly, then swallows. But... What exactly can we do to help? Cosmo shrugs. Hey, I don't know, man. I just figured you might have an idea. Khan looks over the maps and of all the things, spots a lack of hardware. Right. Is there anything you're specifically looking for? Dead drops. Each of them with a two-phase signal. An initial geotype which communicates on encrypted channels and a backup which communicates via VHF. We have no faith the original geotag is working. And as such, I can only imagine they switched to backup. What is in the dead drops? Originally, payment for a job. You could call it a trade. Munitions, networking equipment, cutting edge stuff. It wasn't going to be ours, but given the current situation, I intend to claim it to fortify our location here. Khan nods. What's stopping you from triangulating these frequencies? He points towards the radio. I imagine you found that they are still broadcasting. We've been looking. We need antenna to start and more power afterwards. A proper ham set wouldn't hurt either. If not, we'll have to jerry-rig something, and that's never a sure bet. We should start a list. The others in the room offer a polite chuckle. <laughs> no, seriously. Can I have some of that paper? The guild and some townsfolk sit around a fire in the center of town. Recently constructed benches and tree stumps glisten against the dancing light. Couples and families rest on spread out blankets. The radio plays softly in the background. 
through the wall of wind, night has an encapsulating look to it. You can't perceive the wall as clearly, but you can hear it. The stars aren't little dots, but scattered, blurred motion, which connect gaps in the sky like rain pooling into divots across a lawn. The scariest mission I've ever been on? Lieutenant Oaks looks over to Commander Aberdashi, whom herself still manages to look intimidating while smiling with a cup of tea nestled between both hands. That I can talk about? <laughs> well, that would have been Prague. Mm, beautiful city. Lieutenant Oaks smiles. Tremendously beautiful. The sort of eclectic that can make anyone feel at home. That's actually what led us there. Our target felt the same. They were a check, huh? N no, no, just visiting. Uh, arms dealers who made a living dismantling drones, pushing custom firmware, and selling them off on the black market. Sorry to interrupt, but there's something I've never understood. What are these people getting out of it? The Czech Republic has UBI, doesn't it? Not everyone is motivated financially. There are other items of trade considered acceptable. Gross. Lieutenant Oaks taps her nose and nods. Exactly. Whatever it is your mind filled in the blanks with is probably correct. So you can understand why it was a priority to handle someone like that, which we set up to do. She looks up as if reading a list from the sky. We staked out a club. We knew everyone else present that night. Everyone connected criminally or indicted on their own terms. <sighs> we had people in every entrance. The scans looked clear. Yet, when we went in, well, there was nothing. Everyone stares at her with an awaiting expression. It was our first time dealing with counter-scanning technology. The sort of thing that perceives your signals and shoots it right back, modified to show whatever they want you to see. Ilcat adopts a concerned expression. When you got in, what was in there? A package. Not a bomb. When I saw it, that's what I thought too. Even when the doors started closing behind us, I still thought we were going to explode. But that box had a killing machine inside it. Only the size of a cat, five times as spry. Hook-shaped saws for hands, a titanium-shelled exoskeleton. She sways her head. It chased us around the house and killed two of us. It was one of the scariest missions I had in the real world. The music stops pouring out from the radio, and the voice of Joseph Torrance returns. Hey folks, I hope your evening has been going okay. If you can hear me now, I imagine it's going alright. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. I know. I know the horrors that are out there. What we are all trying to deal with right now. Lieutenant Oaks sits back and smiles, content with the impromptu end to her story. Ilcat leans over. Did you get the guy? After all that? Lieutenant Oaks smiles and nods once. I too have had something taken from me. I am no different from any of you. We are all in a state of mourning. Perpetually. This shared grief is strong enough to become our new identity. Yet I must ask you all to relent in your cynicism. Do not dispel hope. We can get it all back, I promise you. Someone should tell him we're stuck here. If we ever get the chance, I agree. This evening, we have confirmed a number of those lost to us. I will read their names now and pray for their safety wherever they are now. Des leans back and looks at the fire. I know it's all real. I believe that we're here right now. But it still feels... in a way... like... it's happening to someone else. Like I'm just watching myself have this experience. Fiona Ordo, age 24. Sounds like shock. Trauma makes us feel far away. Marcus Cunningham, 
Page 18. The fire crackles. Khan throws on another log. It's been long enough that it feels normal here. I'm used to the town and the smells. Hell, I forget what my old bed even felt like. Samantha Ratting, age 79. I don't think I could ever forget my old bed. It was the fanciest thing I owned. In the old days, I imagine it would cost as much as a car. It was... Joy. Harry and Gordon Leinhold, ages five and nine. Sona Bloom drops to her knees. Eelcat rushes over. Hey, hey, is everything okay? Did something happen? The wind picks up. The fire goes out. An instantly ferocious blizzard begins to flurry from Sonen Bloom's eyes. My kids! They're gone! Well, that was something, wasn't it? I'm Joseph Torrance, and you've been listening to On The Line Podcast. If you'd like to support us on our Patreon, visit patreon.com slash on underscore the underscore line. You can also subscribe directly to our podcast on Buzzsprout. All the links will be in the show notes. So I'd like to thank everybody at the station here. And have a wonderful time. And we will get through this together. I promise you that. Joseph Torrance, signing off for the day. Thank you. <laughs>